We are back on the Rational Boomer podcast. Hopefully your day is going well. It is Saturday. I'm still in Georgia, but I'm all alone today. I had a couple of guests the last couple of shows, but I'm all by myself. Like that great 70s hit from Eric Carmen. If you know, you know. If you don't, you're too fucking young. Google it. <laughs> anyway, we're here sitting in the uh, building next to the pool in Savannah, Georgia, South Southern uh, South Savannah, Georgia, getting ready to do the Rational Boomer podcast. I really enjoy having guests on the show, but from time to time, it's also fun to do it alone because uh, I don't have to worry about interrupting anybody because I do that a fucking lot. I can't help myself. I just keep talking. And when it's just me, it works because I just fucking keep talking. Anyway, I was going to put my coat on as I was doing this, and I thought, well, people think that's weird that I would do the podcast in my coat. But what you have to understand is in this building, uh, they turn the heat off at night. And yes, this is the Deep South. This is Savannah, Georgia. But right now it's in the 40s. And yes, I'm from Minnesota, but I like to be a little comfortable when I'm doing a podcast. Right now it's okay, but later on you may see me pull out the coat. Nonetheless, we will forge forward. And frankly, uh, things have started to heat up throughout the country and throughout politics and throughout the world, for that matter. I told a story on TikTok, and I don't know that I was clear as to why I was telling the story or how I was telling the story. The story, the rumor out on TikTok and other social media is that Donald Trump went to see his beloved Kim Jong-un some time back. You know, they have a little love affair going on. That's a self-described love affair by Donald Trump. And I imagine Donald Trump looking into those beady fucking dictator eyes saying, Kimmy, could you help a brother out? <laughs> and apparently, according to the story or the rumor, is that Donald Trump asked him to borrow $20 million for the United States of America. Because, of course, you know, the United States of America needs $20 million from North Korea. Anyway, in my mindset, um, I presume that Kim Jong-un would do this, thinking he'd have one over on Donald Trump, one over on, uh, on the United States of America, so he gives him the $20 million. Now, as I told the story, I said, uh, after a few years now, where we are, where we are, Kim Jong-un saying, where's the money? And Donald Trump apparently not taking his calls. <laughs> United States basically saying, we don't know nothing about no $20 million. And then I wrapped it up uh, uh, by saying, uh, I don't know if Kim Jong-un is going to look in, into any legal remedies for this situation. But Kim Jong-un maybe needs to watch out because he may be charged for soliciting prostitution because he just got fucked by Donald Trump. Now, I'm afraid people thought I was being completely serious. I didn't know the whole story to this thing. Uh, this was just a joke. This was just a bit. And I maybe have to preface those things I do like this. Essentially, it's right. But I took some of the rumors, added to the story, and turned it into a joke. Okay? Basically, as I understand it now, and I got a lot of people going, that's not what happened. That's not in the news. Well, it is in the news. Uh, but there's more specific information that came out, and I just want to clarify it. As I understand it now, the real story is that Donald Trump did take about a $20 million loan from a company called Daiwoo. You know, they make the cars and such and all other kinds of things, electronics, all those things that Korea would make. And uh, he borrowed the $20 million. Now, Daiwoo is in South Korea. But apparently they have very strong connections and ties to Kim Jong-un and North Korea. Now, as I understand it, the real story, the real meat to this is that he took this $20 million loan while he was president and didn't tell anybody. He tried to hide it. Now, some reports say he did pay it back, and I don't know. The idea that uh, Donald Trump paid anybody back for any amount of money he owed them, that's the most unbelievable part of the fucking story. So I don't know that he paid it back. But again, when something like that comes out, the stories and the rumors abound. And uh, I took a little uh, 
poetic license, if you will. And I made it a joke. And um, I'm sorry if you felt like it was inaccurate. Here's the deal. I didn't think it was an important story. I don't think it matters to anything that's going on now. There's bigger stories. It was just another way to make Donald Trump look stupid. I realize that's a pretty easy duck shoot, but uh, I thought it was funny. <laughs> now, I don't know. Maybe he did get $20 million from Kim Jong-un directly. I don't fucking know. I mean, I think that's what we're going to find out in the coming months as more evidence comes to comes to light. We're going to find out about a lot of criminal and corrupt behavior by Donald Trump that we never thought of, never heard of, never even fucking imagined. This dumb little story will be nothing compared to what we will learn in the coming months. So anyway, <laughs> Donald Trump either paid it back or he didn't. He got it directly from Kim Jong-un or he didn't. Doesn't matter. Anybody that borrows Donald Trump any amount of money is a dumb motherfucker. And the only reason they would do that is because they think they might get some preferential treatment in the United States of America. I mean, let's be honest, the president is asking for the money. So you would think you would have some, some sway if you had to deal with something in America. But again, the real story to the real, uh, the, I won't say crime, but the real sketchy part of this is he took this loan while president and tried to hide it. Just like Donald Trump is known to do. That's who he is. All right. With guests the last couple of days, we have a lot of emails to get to, of course. And I love the emails. That's the best part of coming back and doing the show alone. A bunch of emails. So let's get to it. Good evening, Mike. I heard a wonderful explanation about the 14th Amendment and why it was put in place by David Blight, a history professor, Yale University. He was on Lawrence O'Donnell this evening, probably yesterday. He blew Donald Trump's explanation, or I should say his attorney's explanations of why the Secretary of State didn't have the authority to take Donald Trump off the ballot. It's quite educational, and I believe that anyone interested in learning more about the 14th Amendment so that they understand it better and know why it was put in place, um, I'm sure they can find it on MSNBC. I really enjoy when they have historians on to explain things and educate us because there's a lot, awful lot of information that I've learned over the last few years that I don't believe was ever included in my history classes in high school. Have a great evening, Mike, and look forward to your next podcast. As always, Judy, Crazy Cat Mom, Portland, Oregon. Uh, and I think I pronounced it right this time. Because when I named Judy, Crazy Cat Mom, Portland, Oregon, somebody called me out on it, and I believe they said it's Oregon. So whatever. I'm in Minnesota. What the fuck do I know? I'm an old white guy. Hopefully I got it right, Oregon. Anyhow, moving on. My husband and I spotted this in the paper this morning. It was in this day in history section. In 2018, Donald Trump disbanded a commission that he had set up to investigate voter fraud in the 2016 election, an election he won. Why? Because he didn't win the popular vote. Apparently more than a dozen states refused to cooperate. I had never heard about this, and I uh, LMAO, laughing my ass off, uh, he is so stupid. Yes, he is, is definitely stupid. That goes without saying. This is one more reason I referred to him as the moron in chief for four years. I don't know if you knew or had heard about this, but I thought I'd share it. We just can't get rid of him soon enough. Looking forward to more podcasts and TikToks. Have a great day. Barb from Janesville, Wisconsin. Now, Barb, Janesville, Wisconsin, a little ways away from my home state, but I've had occasion to be in Janesville, a very nice, quaint little town. Hope to get back there again sometime. But Barb, thank you very much. Yeah, I have heard about this. Maybe not this specific story. But I know that Donald Trump was really butthurt after the 2016 election. He wanted investigations. He had all this stuff. And why? Well, he did win. But the fact that he did not win the popular vote just absolutely eats at him. 
So he had to try to figure that out or explain it away. And that's what he tried to do. And of course, it didn't work. And this, this, this example is exactly why I've been telling you what I've been telling you. You can have indictments, you can have charges, you can have being exposed for lies and corruption that he's done. But if you embarrass him, if you try to make him out to be lesser than anybody, that is going to drive him nuts. He's a narcissist. He thinks he's the greatest person on earth. And if you can somehow show that he's not, he'll go fucking nuts. And we're kind of seeing it now. Every time he does something, it's fucking stupid. And he gets exposed for being stupid. And that's why I'm saying over the next 10 months, things are going to go badly for Donald Trump. He is going to be made to look stupid. And I don't know that emotionally he can handle this. I mean, he's going to be a 78-year-old man, not in the best condition, certainly not in the best mental condition. You start fucking with his head with uh, trials and lawsuits and people taking your money and the possibility of going to jail and then people pointing out and proving that you're an idiot. I don't know that Donald Trump can handle that. All right. Next email. Congratulations on hitting 300,000 peers. Yeah. For those of you that didn't hear, I announced it. I'm not big on milestones, but on TikTok, I reached 300,000 followers, as they call it. I call them peers because I'm not a leader. This is not a fucking cult. This is just trying to bring people of a like mind together and gain a little <laughs> foothold, gain a voice or some power. <laughs> He goes on to say, dude, that's 60% the size of Woodstock. In the words of Joe Biden, that's a big fucking deal. <laughs> it is a big deal. I mean, when I first got onto TikTok, I imagine maybe if I get lucky, I'll get 10,000 followers. Well, then when we surpassed 10,000 fairly quickly, I thought, wow, maybe I can get to 50. And then I got really cocky and said, well, maybe we'll get to 100. And then it was 200, and here we are at 301,000 followers. And again, what that really means is that's not a celebration of Mike and his genius uh, with the Rational Boomer podcast. It really is a celebration that we exist. You know, if you were to talk to young people and people of my age or similar age or even Gen Xers, this is the point when young people are trying to push us aside, says we don't count. Get out of the way. Let us take over. Now, I'm fine with that. But to suggest that people of our age don't count is ridiculous. And if you want proof of that, here's 300,000 people on TikTok thinking the same way. And it, to me, it's really more important that these people have come together. It's more a celebration of all the people that found this spot. I What I will take credit for is being a rallying spot for people of a like mind, because there's plenty of folks out there a lot smarter than I am. I'm just the loudest one with the platform now. But as you can hear when I have uh, listeners on the show, very, very smart people, in many cases, smarter than I am. So I'm smart enough to bring the smart people on and make me look good. See what I mean? Anyway, he goes on to say, I don't know how many folks listen to your podcast and if that drives more peers, but I think it would be great to get to 400,000 fast. But, you know, I don't think that's going to happen. It's really interesting about the TikTok growth. It's really been on a consistent pace. It's like 100,000 every 12 months or 13 months. I started in November of nine, November 19th of what? 2021, maybe? 20? I don't, I don't know. I've been doing this a little over three years. And um, I got to 100 at about 22. And then I got, uh, no, it must have been 20. Because I got to 100 to 21, 200 to 22. And uh, 23, we got to um, 300,000. And now we're headed into 24. It may take a year before I get to 400,000. But, you know, it really doesn't matter. I don't do this for followers. I don't do this for money because because none of that really matters. I do it in hopes to make an impact. And now with 300,000 peers, I feel like there is an impact being made. I appreciate not only you folks listening or watching, but also interacting. I like the idea that we're stirring some minds and getting people talking. That's where the real power is. 
He goes on to say, you never asked for this, but I can. How about if everyone who listens to the podcast goes and gets one or two new people to go on TikTok and hit the follow button? Well, that's very nice. And it's not necessary. I mean, like I say, what I've gained in TikTok right now is way above anything I fucking imagined. So if I didn't get another follower or peer again, I'd be fucking content. Um, he goes on to say, hell, half of us have kids that talked us into TikTok to begin with. Make those ingrates do it. Then find one other friend and browbeat them until you have to do it. We all do have multiple harder things every day. <laughs> yeah, that's what I want. I want a bunch of listeners that were browbeating, browbeaten into listening. Good idea. <laughs> He goes on to say, let's get your cantankerous ass up to 400,000 more peers, more influence, more fun. Best garage door, Jeff. I know what you were thinking is this email was going along. You're thinking to yourself, yeah, that's garage door, Jeff. All right. That sounds like that motherfucker. Um, and, you know, to be honest, in spite of my advanced age, this is the first time I've ever been called cantankerous. So this is a milestone that I appreciate. I know I'm an old guy. I've been called many names every fucking day from Trump fucks and, well, my family. Uh, but cantankerous has never been one of them. So uh, Garage Door Jeff, you have brought us a first. And I wear that, that uh, title, cantankerous, with pride. I am a bit cantankerous. I am a bit of, uh, what's the other word? Um, curmudgeon. There, people people will call me a curmudgeon from time to time. And for years, I didn't know what that meant. But then I read the definition. I, yeah, that's me. That's definitely me. All right, the next email goes as follows. My wife and I went there based on, okay, I got to preface this thing. A gentleman emailed me. And he, he was saying, hey, have fun in Georgia and make sure you take your son and your and your wife to Isola's, which is in Hinesville, about 30 miles away from where we are. And it's this absolute wonderful buffet, all Southern food. It was fucking fantastic. And the reason I found out about it was on TikTok, because they had their own TikTok and they had a huge following. And I'd see it every day. I go, that fucking mac and cheese, that fried, ch I got to go get it. And I told my wife, I said, we're driving 30 miles to go have dinner at Isola's. She goes, it better be fucking good. <laughs> and then when we got done, my wife looked at me and she says, we got to go back there because that shit was good. And it was. So he was reminding me to go to Isola's when I came down to Savannah. And now nobody has to remind me to go get good food. That's maybe foremost on my mind. And when you look at my wife and I, uh, as old as we are, we have one social aspect to our life, and that's pretty much going out to dinner. We were driving around Savannah today, and we're telling my son, well, that place is really good, and that place is really good. He goes, what place have you not fucking eaten in? I go, well, there's still a lot left, but we're working on it. Anyway, I pointed out to him something horrible that, that I found out about Isola's. They shut down their TikTok account and they closed the doors forever. It's not just for the weekend or for the month. It's closed down forever. Apparently COVID took its toll and they were unable to rebound. And this, this is a tragedy in this part of the country because it was an absolutely perfect place to go. Um, anyway, it's closed down now. And I was sad to hear that. And I told this gentleman you know, I would go to Isola's, but they shut it down. And he obviously didn't know. And this is how he responded to that. He says, my wife and I went there based on your visit and talking about it on your podcast. I love the food, but that night in the hotel, I paid a heavy penalty due to overeating. I get it. That's always my goal when I go to a buffet. I want to be full but I don't want to hate myself and be in pain when I walk out the door. There was a time when I was young, I could eat as much as I want. Didn't fucking matter. And yes, you might take, a, it might take its toll in the room later. 
but now I, ju I just can't do it. I can't eat as much as I used to. I can't take the pain and discomfort of eating too much. So I don't know if I ever got my money's worth at Isola's, but the food was outstanding. It was worth the price. He goes on to say, I'm sad to hear they closed. It was definitely a unique experience going there. The reason that we went to Savannah for vacation last May was 100% talking about that town in your podcast. <laughs> well, then I should hit the uh, Savannah Chamber of Commerce up for a little fucking uh, commercial consideration. No, I'm kidding. I would recommend it to anybody. Like I say, we came to Savannah one time with the family years ago. And then my wife and I came back a couple more times and the opportunity came up where we could buy a condo and there was never any question. It, it For us, it gives us everything we're looking for. And I've told people before, they go, you bought a place in Savannah? Why? I said, well, if you have to ask me why, you've never been to fucking Savannah. Some of the nicest, sweetest people you could ever fucking meet. The food, the culture, the beach at Tybee. We went to Tybee yesterday. Cold as a motherfucker. It looked like the Japanese tsunami coming in off the beach, but it was still cool to be there. The restaurants, the shops and all that stuff. It's all open. Not all of it, but a lot of it's open. Uh, so anyway, thank you for taking my advice and I'm glad it worked out for you. Uh, he goes on to say, I love your podcast. Please keep it coming. Thank you for your reply. Looking forward to hear your voice tonight. Well, you are hearing it, Joe. And I think... Uh, your email came a couple of days ago, and I'm sorry I haven't gotten to it until now, but, you know, of course, we had some guests, and it's a little hard to do the emails when you have guests. Now, I got this email, and this is a story I heard recently. Retiring House Republican says $174,000 isn't enough money for members of Congress. Most of us don't have wealth. Oh, God forbid. Now, I can't remember who said this, but he's a guy that's retiring or something. And uh, uh, this gentleman, I don't see his name here. He sent me a link to read and it took me to the, 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 um, the headline page, but I couldn't get into the meat of it. So I'll dig into it later and, and figure out who it was. It really doesn't matter because they're all grifting money anyway. Apparently $174,000 a year isn't enough for any of them. He goes on to say they're overpaid for the little that they do. I would love a job with that pay, holidays, and vacation. He doesn't speak about the stipends that they also get for their living expenses while in D.C., not to mention the lifetime health care and the fucking pensions for life. <laughs> Here's the point, and this is where politicians don't get it anymore. Being a congressman, being a senator, being a president, being anybody in politics was never meant to be a fucking career. It was kind of like going in the service. Our forefathers said, okay, if you're a farmer, if you're, if you're a merchant, if you're whatever, go and do your time in Congress, then get the fuck out and have somebody else do it. That's the way it should be running. But now, of course, today we got people in there expecting to get rich. And when they don't get rich, they bitch about how much they get paid. Apparently, even Supreme Court justices. We know what Clarence Thomas did when, when uh, they went to the Speaker of the House and said, I think it was the Speaker of the House, and said, I don't make enough money. So what they did is they hooked him up with some billionaire sugar daddies and got him all kinds of money. Um, <clears throat> it's a sad state of affairs when you have a job with all the perks you could possibly want, all the security you possibly want with health care and pensions for the rest of your fucking life, and you're going to bitch about what you get paid. Because it seems like some of the other members of Congress do just fine, you know, in the stock market or taking money under the table. Maybe you're just not smart enough to <laughs> steal money like everybody else. But if $174,000 a year isn't enough or isn't a fair price for, um, for, for what you're doing, well, then I think you should do something different. All right, the next one says, Hi, Mike, it seems to me that Vice President Harris has been kept in the background so far during Biden's administration because of Biden's age. I would think she would look at, be looked at a little closer for the 2024 election. 
Do you know why the VP has been seemingly kept in the background? Was this strategy a poor media coverage? Was it planned that way? Actually, I may have read this email before, but I'll read it again. I'm curious to hear what you might think. Thank you, Joshua. Um, well, Joshua, I've said all along that I think that um, that they should have uh, showcased Kamala Harris uh, because Joe's so old and people are concerned about him being so old. They have to feel comfortable with who might step in his space if something happened. I think a lot of people who know Kamala Harris have seen her in 2016 when she was running, have listened to her, probably do feel comfortable with her. But with the Republicans constantly talking shit about her, well, it's hard to know what people think. I think they should have showcased her more. I think that was a mistake. I think that was important to the 2024 election. I mean, it's not a game breaker. It's not a deal breaker, but they could have done that better. I suspect hopefully in this year that that's going to happen. They're going to showcase her a little bit more. We had a speech yesterday from Joe Biden, and he's going more in the attack mode. So maybe we're seeing the strategies on the Democratic side starting to heat up where they should be. All right. Next one. Hello, Boomer. Happy New Year, and I hope you enjoy Savannah. Great town. Yes, it is. I listened to Alina Haba's interview on a recording from yesterday and again on Oberman's podcast. Um, she basically warned and threatened uh, SCOTUS that they better remember who put them there, namely Kavanaugh and the Handmaiden. <clears throat> they will do the lawful th right thing and find immunity and keep him on the various ballots as Oberman in interjected, or else. <clears throat> I think you'll admit this is a bit frightening. Just how much guts do these people have and just how deep in DJT's pockets are they? In my opinion, we may be in some dark new territory here. The justices themselves may be facing violence and worse. Something to think about, another nagging possibility that keeps a guy up at night. I'm thankful for your podcast and positive energy, Z-Man. <coughs> well, I did hear about this. And I have to wonder if it's not going to get Alina Haba in a bit of trouble. You can't make those kinds of threats against the court and expect to get away with it. Thus far, she has. But I think the future for Alina Haba is not going to be bright. Donald Trump is going to get taken down in the criminal cases, in the immunity case. And then she's going to lose her shit and say something she shouldn't. Not to mention the fact that some of her practices up to this point, have a little, been a little suspect. And she probably might be looking at some sanctions or very possibly a disbarment, like so many other of the lawyers have. I don't think her future is bright. I think she's not the brightest lawyer in the world, not the brightest human in the world for that matter. All right, the next email. Hello, Mike. Happy New Year to you and your family. Your ride is about to get bumpy, mate. As Junie gets older, her energy increases, so you'll be in shape as time goes on. He's, of course, talking about my uh, granddaughter, Junie, Juniper. And she, I've said it before, she is a pistol. And uh, she knows I'm a soft touch, and she knows how to put me in her place. She's spitting image of my wife. <laughs> People have said that. They said they, she looks like my wife. And... Um, Acts like me, kind of, but acts like my wife, too, because we're not that different. Uh, but if that's the case, I'm in some deep motherfucking trouble, and I'm going to have to do a lot of moving. And I better get in shape because I can't keep up with that little girl. And uh, she ain't going to be an easy one, but I love that kid to death. Um, email goes on to say, I'm still on board the 2024 train, the blue one, hanging on to your word now. But there's more folks looking to pass JB over because of the Gaza stuff. The Gaza stuff. I don't know. Chris Christie and Alyssa on the View both said they they do a write-in rather than vote for Donald Trump or Joe Biden. Hearing that a lot of late. Well, what do you expect out of Republicans? They're smart enough not to vote for um, uh, Donald Trump, but they certainly aren't going to vote 
re, uh, Democrat because because it's um, it's beneath them to vote Democrat, even though it may be the right thing to do. So I'm not um, I'm not too worried about that. I think a lot of people want to make a big thing about all the people upset with Joe Biden about Gaza. I don't think that's really a thing, not to the extent that it's going to have a big impact. I think it's a lot of Republican messaging, trying to get people to believe that. I, I, I Honestly, if you put 10 men and women in a room and you say, what's more important to you, Joe Biden's stance with Israel or taking away constitutional rights away from women and overturning Roe v. Wade? We're talking about millennials and Gen Zs. Which one do you think is going to be more important to them? Without question, the Roe v. Wade situation. So that's why I'm not really all that worried about it at this point. Um, he goes on to say, is it only America bankrolling Israel? Folks want Joe Biden to shut the bank. Um, I don't think they are the only ones uh, bankrolling Israel. Um, and... We really don't have a choice. We are an ally. And as an ally, we have to help them. If Donald Trump were the president, he'd have to help Israel. So you can whine and cry about all this shit, but what is, is. And it's going to happen. So, you know, I, I've told you before, I don't even want to get in this debate. It's a no-win situa situation for some dumbass white guy sitting in the Midwest I don't have a dog in the fight, so I don't really talk about it much because I don't think it's my my issue. I'm not saying it's not an issue to the country. I just don't think I have anything valuable to offer to it. He goes on to say, I happened upon a crime show on the Oxygen Channel last night, the murder of Amy Robinson, Texas, year 1988. DT was not a thing back then, but this case would be very controversial for him today. The two lads that tortured and killed this girl, Michael Hall and Kevin Nelville, uh, decided to skip town across the border to Mexico. Who would have thunk it? But according to DT, Mexico sends us their worst. Isn't that a hoot? Yeah, exactly. A lot of people run to Mexico when they're in trouble here. This case took place in Texas, Fort Worth, if I recall correctly. So the lads went over the border to escape justice, but too late, they were captured at the border and hauled back to the pristine USA, Texas to be exact. The case was so horrific, they were both executed by lethal injection in 2006 and 2011. And let's not forget Cancun Ted leaving his constituents high and dry in the freezer. And his dog with no food and no heat. Nice guy. I tell you what, it's one thing if you fuck with people, but if you abuse dogs, you're unredeemable as far as I'm concerned. He says, I cannot get over the hypocrisy of these politicians. But remember, DT as president said in Vlad's presence that America isn't without fault. In the same breath, dissing the CIA officers, leaders, but let's not let those folks cross over the border because of the nature of their unproven crimes bestowed upon them by Donald Trump. Anyway, enjoy your home away from home. Take care and keep up the good work. I think you said both your wife and old soul are into crime shows, etc. Yes, they are. Maybe they can look into this one. I'll send the tissues. Take care. And keep on keeping on. Cheers to old soul. And yes, I wrote a times or so before. And that comes to us from Marcy. Well, Marcy, thank you very much. I'll pass it on to old soul. I don't even have to pass it on to old soul. I know she's listening. She'll probably respond to you in the, uh, the comments, mainly because she's more efficient and more on top of shit than I will ever be. And I appreciate that out of her. But I'll mention it to my wife as well. She's always uh, appreciative of, of the mentions here on the podcast. Now that she believes what I'm doing has some merit. When I first started doing TikToks in the podcast, she goes, oh, Jesus, there's Mike just playing fucking radio again. But now she's kind of grasped that there is an audience and a lot of people listening. So it is valid. So thank you for validating my efforts here 
to my wife. All right, we are going to take a quick break and we will be right back. We are back on the Rational Boomer podcast, second half of today's podcast. And I forgot to mention when we started, this is an anniversary, of course. This is January 6th, 2024, the third year anniversary of the attack on our Capitol by the uh, toothless, ignorant, dumb fuck Trump LaFox. You remember, we've talked about it a lot. And there are still people today on the Republican side of things, trying to tell us, oh, nothing happened. It was just a peaceful protest. A few people got out of hand. Well, since that time, we've learned a lot. You know, We've learned that there was extensive plans and strategies set up by not only the dumb Trump fucks, but people in our member, uh, members of Congress, people, members of the administration, Donald Trump himself, friends of Donald Trump, it was a pretty extensive thing, but even still, they want to deny that anything happened. Well, over the next 10 months, a lot of that is going to be exposed, and it's going to be hard for them to deny it any longer. So this is an anniversary, not a pleasant anniversary, but an anniversary we should never forget. That was a dangerous time in this country. I remember sitting on the couch with my wife watching it, and we had two totally different reactions to it. I was intrigued and I wanted to take in every bit of what's going on. And my wife was terrified. If I had been smart, I'd been terrified, but I was too intrigued by what was going on. But my wife saw something that she'd never seen before and she was fearful for the future of this country, which is something we should all be concerned about. In retrospect, I understand what she was thinking and I share her opinion in that. And if we forget it, we're at risk of repeating it. And I don't think this country can take another repeat of that sort of thing. We were lucky in that situation that they weren't successful, that they were too stupid and too unorganized in spite of all the efforts they put in to not succeed. But to think that they wouldn't succeed a second time, that's a lot to ask for. So we have to be careful. We have to be loud. We have to expose these fucks for who they are and make sure every last one of them is accountable. All right, we had some big news from the Supreme Court yesterday. We know that the Colorado Supreme Court made a decision to take Donald Trump off the ballot. Just a couple of days ago, Donald Trump said, I'm appealing to the U.S. Supreme Court, which for my money is a risky call. Not surprising for a dumb fuck like Donald Trump, uh, but a risky call nonetheless. And I spoke to Eric about it in the previous show. See, the problem is, is uh, he's all in, all in on this one. Now, if somehow the Supreme Court sides with him and puts him back on the ballot, he's cool. But if somehow the Supreme Court sides with the Colorado Supreme Court, then theoretically he's going to be taken off a number, if not all, of the ballots in the country, which means he's out of the election. That doesn't mean he won't show up on the ballot as a third party or something like that. The problem is, as the 14th Amendment says, no one who's been involved in an insurrection can hold office. So even if he got voted in, none of that shit would count, and he couldn't hold office. So this is a serious play for Donald Trump. He's got two of his main strategies, his defenses, with the Supreme Court. The first one is his absolute immunity. He's not going to get that from the appellate court. Coming up in a couple of days here, they'll probably make that decision. It will go to the Supreme Court, and there's no way the Supreme Court is going to give him immunity. Just not going to happen. So that's going to take away a chunk of his defense. The other thing is he believes he can get out of all this legal trouble simply by being elected president. Now, I've told you, if everything goes forward as it is right now, he can't win. He just can't fucking, I don't care what anybody says. I'll argue this topic with anybody if they want to, but he can't win. But if the Supreme Court finds against him and for the Colorado Supreme Court, then he's done. 
his one hope, his one Hail Mary pass will be gone. Because once the Supreme Court decides on this, there's no place else to go. He can't appeal. He can't divert. He can't delay. He is fucked. So I'm really interested to see what the Supreme Court will do. I don't honestly know. Common sense and logic and rule of law would suggest that they would side with the Colorado Supreme Court. But then you have to look at our Supreme Court and realize we've got a lot of trump -a fuck fucks on this thing. We don't know exactly what they will do. The most important thing, I will tell you this. If they find for the Colorado Supreme Court, yay, Donald Trump's out of the mix. Now all we have to do is make him accountable for all his bullshit. But if they find for Donald Trump and he's on the ballot, don't freak out. Don't think this is Armageddon. Don't think it's over because it's not. Donald Trump's got a lot of hurdles to go through in the next 10 months. He's got to get through some uh, criminal trials, try to stay out of jail. He's got to try to hold on to some money when Judge Engeron uh, in New York in the next few days is going to take all of it. All of it. I've got a story uh, about how much Letitia James wants. We've been hearing about $250 million. Well, we heard yesterday that she's up that to $370 million. And it's conceivable it will be even more than that. But anywhere in that zone, Donald Trump ha doesn't have the money to cover it. So he's going to be in trouble. So anyway, the U.S. Supreme Court has agreed to review a state court's decision disqualifying former President Donald Trump from appearing on Colorado's primary ballot. Again, this is about the primary. This is not about the general election. Now, oral arguments are scheduled to commence February 8th, about a month away. The court's decision Friday to take up the case follows a Colorado Supreme Court ruling in December that Trump is ineligible for office because he violated the 14th Amendment um, which states that anyone who took their oath and uphold, to uphold the Constitution and then engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the nation must be barred from state or federal office. Now, um, Donald Trump most certainly did what he's being accused of. There's no way to look at it. You can try to bullshit your way around this. <laughs> it is what it is. He did what he did. It's just a matter if the Supreme Court is going to do their job or they're going to do Donald Trump's bidding. Now, I have to own up to the fact when I first heard it was going to go to the Supreme Court, I said my guess was that they probably just sent it back to the states. Too controversial. They got enough troubles and they don't want to wade into this. Kind of thought that's the way it would go. Now, when I talked to old So, she said they thought that they would take it up and that they would find for Donald Trump. That's what she feels. And let's be honest, old soul is smart as a whip. Now at this point, since they didn't push it off to the States, I can tell you, I hope that they side with Colorado Supreme court, but I honestly don't know. I don't know what to expect out of this. I think there's a lot of good reasons for them to side with the Colorado Supreme court, but do they have the courage to go up against Donald Trump this time around? Now keep in mind, the Supreme court hasn't found in favor of Donald Trump all that much. They've gone against him before. So it's not unprecedented if they side with the Colorado Supreme court. The bottom line is they're going to have the arguments on February 8th. Some point after that, we'll find out what the decision is, and uh, it'll make a big difference to this country and to the future of Donald Trump. Donald Trump's future, regardless, is not good. But if he gets taken off the ballot out of the election, that fucks him up to no end. Now, um, we'll, we'll, we'll see how this all pans out when it, when it happens. Uh, but... Uh, I have a feeling uh, that they're going to come with this quick. The Supreme Court said they understand this is a time-sensitive situation, and they're going to have to come to a quick decision. And I take them at their word. They they understand this. If they don't do it quickly, they're going to be looking like they're sandbagging for Donald Trump, and they can't afford that either. They may not come up with a decision we like, but they're going to do it quick. Either they're going to do it quick to benefit 
the 2024 election, or they're going to do it quick to benefit Donald Trump. And we'll see what happens. Just a, over a week after the Colorado decision, of course, Maine's Secretary of State said Trump alleged 14th Amendment violations had precluded him from appearing on ballots in her state. In total, there are legal challenges questioning Trump's eligibility for office in more than a dozen states, but a Supreme Court ruling on the matter would settle it for the whole country. See, that's where the risk is to Donald Trump. If the Supreme Court sides with the Colorado Supreme Court, I don't know if he'll be off ballot for every state, but enough states where it makes no sense for him to run for re-election. He doesn't have a prayer. He'll be mathematically eliminated from the election. Now, we know that the Supreme Court, dominated by conservatives and packed with three Trump no nominees who so far have proved loyal to the former president's interest. That said, as I've said before, they found against him a number of times. That's why we're just unsure what the hell they're going to do. Here was an interesting announcement yesterday. The Republicans on the House Judiciary and Oversight Committees announced that they will meet next week, Wednesday, to consider holding Hunter Biden in contempt of Congress after he uh, defied the subpoena to appear for a closed-door deposition last month. The committees will meet on Wednesday to consider a report recommending a contempt of Congress resolution against President Joe Biden's son, lawmakers said Friday. Hunter Biden blatantly defied two lawful subpoenas when he did not appear for his December deposition. The Judiciary Committee said in a statement posted to Twitter, um, the president's son doesn't get special treatment, said House Oversight Chair James Comer in a separate online posting. So Hunter Biden doesn't get special treatment, but somehow Jim Jordan does because he didn't show up either. Now, Representative Jamie Raskin, the ranking member of the Oversight and Accountability Committee, said the committee's actions against a private citizen who has agreed to testify are unwarranted and without precedence. Chairman Comer does not want Hunter Biden to testify in public, just as he has refused to publicly release over a dozen interview transcripts because he wants to keep up carefully curated distortions, blatant lies, and laughable conspiracy theories that have marked this investigation, Raskin said. I like the way that man talks. The facts and the evidence all show no wrongdoing and no impeachable offense by President Biden. Abe uh, Lowell, Hunter Biden's attorney, also dismissed the investigation as a deceptive political game. It's clear the Republican chairman aren't interested in getting facts or they would allow to test Hunter to testify in public. Lowell said in a statement responding to Friday's announcement, House Republicans continue to play politics by seeking an unprecedented contempt motion against someone who has, from the first request, offered to answer all their proper questions. What are they afraid of? Well, that is a, an excellent point. Now, Hunter Biden was called for questioning about his business dealings by House Republicans. They've alleged without offering supporting evidence that his father benefited from his foreign business deals. He said he would answer lawmakers' questions, but only if in a public hearing. I was surprised they announced this, or maybe they're trying to um, do something that covers up for the news that came out yesterday. The news that we find out that <clears throat> Donald Trump while in office, in the first two years of office, not the whole four years, just two years of office, took in $8 million from foreign countries. The top country with the most money to Donald Trump in two years, about a million bucks, China. I tried to say that like Donald does. China. Anyway, the second was Saudi Arabia. It's ironic that they would go hard on Hunter Biden with zero evidence and are completely mum when it talks to Donald Trump with like 400 pages of evidence. That shows you who these fucks are. They are incompetent, they're ignorant, and they don't know when to let up. When that news came out, they had to hit back with something, so they came out with, we're getting together to talk about 
um, holding Hunter Biden in contempt of Congress. I'm going to make a bet with you. I bet they get together Wednesday. They stir things up, make it all exciting to get attention, but I bet they don't do it. I bet they don't do it because think of this. You're going to send the president's son on a recommendation to be charged with contempt of Congress. And who are they sending him to? Merrick Garland, the attorney general appointed by Joe Biden. Now, I'm not saying there's any funny stuff there, but if anybody's going to get some benefit of the doubt and not get lied about or cheated against, Merrick Garland's not going to do that to Hunter Biden. If there is no case, if there is no way to win this, they're not just going to run it through the system just to make noise. Merrick Garland isn't going to do that. And if Merrick Garland doesn't indict him for this reason, you would hope the Republicans would be smart enough not to embarrass themselves again by sending it down to Merrick Garland. Now, we know that they have a propensity of making fools of themselves. So I don't know for sure what's going to happen. But if they're smart, they'll meet Wednesday and then they'll get on some other fucking topic and they'll forget about this one. That's my guess is what they'll do. But if they do send it to the DOJ, nothing's going to come of it. Nothing's going to come of it. Jim Jordan's situation is much more egregious. He just flat out um, refused. Hunter Biden did show up in D.C. and said, I'd be happy to do it in public like you first offered. And then they were backed up on it. Um, they backtracked and said, no, we got to do it in private. Yeah, fuck you. You think you're doing something. That's what the Republicans are always doing. They think they're doing something and they're not. They're not accomplishing anything. They're trying so hard, but nothing works. And nothing works because they have nothing and because they're stupid. All right. Um, next up. Hold on a second here. The effort to submit slates of so-called fake electors in Michigan, which then Donald Trump, then President Donald Trump, he nearly lost that in 2020. It appears to have been a project of the Trump campaign itself, according to a recent report. Now, that's important, and that is serious. It's one thing to have fake electors all around the country and each individual state coming up with this idea completely independently and saying, let's do this. But you and I know that wasn't the case. The fact that there may be some evidence that the Trump campaign was involved in all of these, well, that's a problem. That's a problem that uh, Jack Smith probably knows about and has evidence of. And now there's a report that basically lays that out. The Detroit News reported on internal emails from the Trump campaign that showed how the former president's top legal advisors like John Eastman, Boris Epstein, and Kenneth Cheesebro, who are now cooperating in multiple state fake elector investigations, directly orchestrated the effort to steal electoral college votes from then-candidate Joe Biden. Now remember, all these fucks worked for Donald Trump. The revelations provide further proof that the false elector certificates advanced in seven battleground states, including Michigan, were not organic efforts by local Republican officials to question the election results in their states, but a part of a larger scheme by Trump's campaign to main power, maintain power. Yeah, you see where the problem is? If they can prove they're guilty of that shit, they are fucked. It may explain why Kenneth Cheesebro and Sidney Powell and some of these other people have said, yeah, I'll roll over on Donald Trump and all the rest. According to the news, both Cheesebro and Eastman sought to get fake elector letters to then Vice President Mike Pence in advance of Congress's scheduled certification, uh, certification of the Electoral College count on January 6, 2021. A key component of that strategy was to have the fake elector documents submitted in the names of various state Republican Party officials to make the effort look organic. So now they were trying to cover it up, too. A little suspicious, wouldn't you think? Now, however, the news reported that in Michigan, Trump campaign staffer Sean Flynn actually prepared the mailing 
that was sent on December 15, 2020 to the National Archives in the name of Republican Committee Chairwoman Kathy Bearden. I just want to check if these need to be sent a certain class of mail along with the extra service of certified mail and registered mail, respectively, Flynn wrote in an email to Cheesebro. Yeah, a lot of shit was going on. Now, um, Mike Roman, who was the Trump campaign's director of Election Day Operations, responded to Flynn that he should choose the fastest. Yeah, you got to get it there by January 6th, motherfucker. The infamous, infamous uh, Eastman memo laid out how the fake electors plot would work. If Pence received an alternate slate of electors from a certain state, he could refrain from including those states' electoral votes in the official count, giving Trump a slight advantage. Following Democrats' objections, Pence would have then sent the matter to the House of Representatives, where the state's delegations would have exactly one vote. And the Republicans um, controlled slightly more state delegates than Democrats. This would have also resulted in Trump's victory. You see the scam. These are people who just came out with ways to try to scam the system. It's like lawyers always do. If they have a guilty party, they have to come out with ways to circumvent uh, laws and regulations. They've got to find loopholes. And that's exactly what these lawyers were doing. They were trying to find a loophole that they could use to their advantage. But again, again, like I've told you before, they couldn't do it. They had every possible advantage going into this to do all of these things. And they failed at every turn. That shows you the incompetence and ineptitude of these fucks. All right. Yesterday, President Joe Biden made a major speech, and it came, of course, on the eve of today, January 6th, the third anniversary of the attack on the Capitol. And it was praised by pundits for taking it to Donald Trump and MAGA for decimating the founding ideals of America. Now, that's what we've been waiting for. Joe Biden going uh, batshit crazy against MAGA and the Republicans. <clears throat> I shouldn't say batshit crazy. He wasn't. He was very measured and very strong. And that's what we need him to do. <clears throat> um, I think this comes from the uh, speech. Today, we're here to answer the most important of questions. Is democracy still America's sacred cause? He said while about 10 miles from Valley Forge National Historical Park where 250 years ago, George Washington rallied troops during the Revolutionary War. It's what the 2024 election is all about. Absolutely. It's about constitutional rights for women with Roe v. Wade, and it's about democracy. Once people decide or understand that it's about democracy, it's going to be hard for them to vote against it, unless you're a dumb Trump la fuck, but there's only about 25, 30% of them. So who gives a fuck what they do? Now, the president's remarks were inspired by the 2021 insurrection attempt, of course. Uh, Joe Biden can win in November if he speaks this way every day and never backs down from fighting with all he's got to save our democracy. And this was written by... Uh, Republican Illinois Congressman Joe Walsh in a post on social media. Yeah, Republican. Keep this up, Joe. Tell the American people what's at stake every damn day. This was a great speech. That's what uh, Joe Walsh. And it's not the Joe Walsh you're thinking, you, you fucking baby boomer Gen Xers. Not that Joe Walsh. Now, that Joe Walsh did run for president at one point in the 70s, I think, or 80s. And think in 80, <clears throat> you remember he he formed a uh, party, the keg party. Yeah, that wasn't a serious <laughs> candidacy, but I bet it sold some fucking records. Now, in separate X posts, X or Twitter, Walsh said Republicans cannot defend what Joe Biden is forceful, forcefully calling out. They just can't. He's going at Trump by name and head on, and I love it, and the country needs it. TV host Michael uh, Smirkanish, also he Biden applause in a post on Twitter, uh, said the speech was well written. Now, I'm sure Joe didn't write it. 
He said it was the appropriate length and strongly de uh, delivered, pacing much better than normal. So he's getting into the um, technical parts of this um, speech. Um, political commentator, ter commentator Tara Setmeyer, an ex-Republican, said this is solid messaging. And true, she was referencing the parts of the speech. Donald Trump's campaign is about him, not America, not you. Donald Trump's campaign is obsessed with the past, not the future. He's willing to sacrifice our democracy to put himself in power. Yeah, that's pretty strong, pretty straightforward, and it's about goddamn time. The president's alarm to preserve democracy was something Rick Wilson, another former Republican commentator, backed. So we've got a lot of Republicans that are against Donald Trump that are glad to see Joe Biden finally kicking things up a notch and going after Donald Trump. And I think we're going to see a lot of that between now and November. We're in the home stretch right now. Democracy is on the line. I don't think Donald Trump can win under any circumstances. I don't know that he'll even survive politically between now and November of 2024. But this is no time to let up on the gas. This is the time when Joe Biden has to be strong, has to be a leader. That's what people relate to, a strong leader. People are scared right now. They need some of that fear waylaid. And the one way to do that is to have a strong leader who's willing to fight. And that's what Joe Biden needs to do. Um, where are we at? I think we got one more here. It's kind of interesting. Uh, Donald Trump Friday issued an all caps rebuttal, big surprise, to New York Attorney General Letitia James closing arguments with the claims her new $370 million damages demand is proof of a Department of Justice witch hunt. <clears throat> so what happened? We'd heard all along that this lawsuit that's going to be coming to culminating very soon, that uh, Letitia James was asking for $250 million. But in her closing arguments, she upped the ante to $370 million. And let's be perfectly honest. It may go even higher than that. It could go up to a half a billion. It could go even higher than that. I don't know. Well, we're talking about punitive damage, too, so it could be even double that. But regardless of what it is, $250 million or a billion, doesn't really matter. Donald Trump can't afford any of it. He's going to have to liquidate some of his properties. And since most of his properties are pretty well leveraged, there isn't a lot of equity in them. So that means he's going to have to liquidate more of his property. And as I've said all along, they're going to take all his money, all his property, and he's going to be... Uh, uh, a broke-ass bitch is what he's going to be. But Donald Trump is still fighting. He's still screaming. And I say screaming only because I see his truth social posts are all in caps. And this is what he wrote. He said, I did nothing wrong. My financial statements are great and very conservative. The corrupt AG wants $370 million as businesses flee New York. They should pay me. This is prosecutorial misconduct. A DOJ witch hunt. Oh, we've heard that before. And how's that worked out for you whenever you've done that? Now, there are a few problems with Trump's theory, namely, as her title suggests, uh, New York Attorney General James is not a member of the Federal Justice Department, but the head of her state's Department of Law. So how the DOJ figures into this, I don't know. And apparently Donald Trump doesn't know either. It's also worth noting that James filed her accusations in a state civil court, while special counsel Jack Smith, the prosecutor who accuses Trump of attempting to overturn the 2020 election and of illegally uh, storing classified documents, filed this in federal criminal courts. James' case claims Trump and his associates defrauded investors and banks for inflating the value of his properties. Both sides filed their closing arguments in court. But again, you have to remember the guilt in this matter, and I don't know that you call it guilt with a lawsuit, liability, uh, that's already been decided by Judge Angeron. He's already found that Donald Trump did all this egregious uh, fraud while in business. Right now, we're just trying to determine how much he's going to have to pay. 
But Donald Trump keeps trying to get it dismissed and try to work his way out of this deal. The deal is done, Donnie. You've already been found liable for fraud, massive fraud. This is just about the money. The lawyers should sit. <laughs> the lawyer should sh sit this dumb fuck down and say, Donnie, you already lost, motherfucker. Now, in a follow-up post, Trump gave the caps lock a much-needed rest. He said, no victims, no crime, great financial statements. Letitia James is doing this to me. Yeah, isn't she? Isn't she, though? She's absolutely doing it to him. And uh, well, I've heard people say this before. I love this phrase. I've never, it's never really fit my vernacular to say it, but I'm sure Donald Trump is thinking it. Fuck me running. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but uh, Donald Trump has got to be feeling like that at this point. Uh, it's going to be interesting because in, in a not too distant period, we are going to find out what the ultimate decision is as to how much he owes. And then it's going to be interesting to see how he does it. Is he going to do it like uh, Rudy Giuliani, who doesn't even have close to the money that he's liable for? I have a feeling it's going to be similar to that. I mean, hes uh, they're asking for a lot more money than uh, Rudy Giuliani. Presumably, Donald Trump has more money, but uh, not enough. Not enough um, other than to be completely destroyed. When they take all his money and all his property, he will still probably owe money. He will owe money for the rest of his life. At that point, he should hope for two things, go to jail or keel over, because he'll never be out from under the debt. He can't file bankruptcy like he loves to do. He can't get out from under it with bankruptcy. And uh, this is going to follow him around everywhere he goes. The only thing he can be glad of is that he's 78 and his time on this earth may be limited. All right. We are going to wrap up the Rational Boomer podcast. I want to thank you for spending the time to listen. I hope you have a great day and uh, we will talk to you again tomorrow.